DraftKings. And today's is a pretty simple question with a very complicated answer. Which team will win the NFC Championship? Let's go around the horn. Swagoo, who you got in the NFC? <clears throat> I'm going to Los Angeles Rams. I picked them last year to win the Super Bowl. I think the addition of Bobby Wagner, I believe Allen Robinson with one-on-one -on -one matchups because of Cooper Cup being opposite of him, he's going to have a big season. And remember, guys, like Cooper Cup is that dude. He's going to get the ball even when you know he's unavailable. Matt Stafford and him have that rapport. And this is another little tidbit. What if OBJ signs back? with the Los Angeles Rams. Can you imagine trying to defend that offense while we talk about all these guys in the AFC West? So he's got yeah. the Rams. Nick, how about you? That's a good choice, and you left out two Hall of Famers on the defense, too, which matter a lot, but I'm going to go a little different. I think San Francisco is the team that's going to win the NFC. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that this team has performed under uh, Jimmy Garoppolo su suggests to me that they are very great because they made him into a quarterback <laughs> that I think other teams should want, and that defense is outstanding, too. So adding the dynamic playmaking ability of Trey Lance to the mind of uh, – Kyle Shanahan in that defense that seems to have no real holes. I think they are in line to win the NFC. All right, so it's West heavy so far. Fowler, who you got? Yeah, Nick made the argument for me, but I'm going to stay in the NFC West, San Francisco 49ers. I picked them a few weeks ago. I'm Ooh. not going to come off it just yet. Even though I think the Bucks, maybe a few other teams have a better overall roster, the 49ers are built kind of like the Rams, where they have five or six superstar players, and they fill in the gaps around them. But I think their secondary has gotten better. That was an issue before. If they can just be decent in the middle of the offensive line, Trent Williams and those boys can do the rest. All right, fair enough. Look, I mean, I, I appreciate all the picks, but to me, it's not that complicated. Let me go back and read this again here. Is the question about getting to the Super Bowl, is Tom Brady still playing? Yes, he is. He's always the answer. So Tampa Bay is the right. Until he retires, Tom Brady and Tampa Bay is the answer. Uh, and, and he's got him right where they want him now. Everybody's writing him off now. What Russell Wilson is getting offered, the idea of liking a tweet, talking about Walmart money, the new owners of uh, the Broncos being able to pay Russell Wilson that type of money suggests that maybe Lamar would be interested in a contract like that, which changes everything. Because prior to this, I could understand the Baltimore Ravens and Steve Bashotti saying, just because the Browns did something somewhat unprecedented doesn't mean we have to, but I cannot for the life of me, understand why they wouldn't pay him top of the market money that's not fully guaranteed like Russell or like um, Patrick Mahomes or like any of these other guys who have gotten Josh Allen, who have gotten contracts recently. So it kind of raises some questions and it's been quiet negotiations from both sides so far. It'll be interesting to find out the details when we do. Well, let's show everybody what you're talking about. So in case anyone didn't see it, because uh, Lamar Jackson has been very quiet coming out of there. Uh, so the only time we really hear from him has been on social media. So here's what Dominique is talking about. Marlon Humphrey uh, tweeted, Walmart money different, meaning those are the new owners in Denver and the Russell Wilson uh, contract extension, to which Lamar Jackson responded, uh, to be completely honest, I had to ask a lot of people what that meant. <laughs> Uh, but I, I guess it means I swear, like he's 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 he's, he's co-signing, right? That that idea, uh, Dominique, help me with this because I don't know that I'm using the right <laughs> words to describe what that means. But basically, he's yeah. saying yes, you're right. They've got a lot more money, and he's he's essentially. How would you interpret what it is he's saying there, candidly? Yeah, no, I think you nailed it right on the money right there. But it, to to me, what it suggests is that money is different over there. They have the ability to offer and the willingness to offer and sign that type of money, which would suggest that Baltimore does not or has not, which is shocking to me because I thought it was about getting like over 250 guaranteed. If you can't get like 160 guaranteed, then I don't know what the Ravens are doing. They're trying to enter this season in a situation where they might be rooting against their own quarterback. Like the better he plays, the more he accomplishes the things that I suspect they all want to accomplish, the more expensive he's going to get. For the life of me, I can't understand that they're not going to sign him for something close to what Russell has received. Fair enough. So, Jeremy Fowler, my insider extraordinaire. Let me ask you the question that I think is on the minds of every Ravens fan and maybe every football fan. Yeah. What the actual heck is going on in that negotiation right now? We're nine days from them kicking off their season. Yeah, so I've been asking around this this morning. The people I've talked to remain skeptical that something will get done by week one. I'm told the Deshaun Watson deal has complicated matters for a long time because of that $230 million all guaranteed. I'm told the Ravens have tried in the last month 
they've upped their offer, but it's just not quite enough. And talking to some people around the league, to Dominique's point, there's a feeling as they're trying, do they really want to try hard enough to get it done? Because they know what it would take. It would take a massive number that they're just not comfortable with right now. So this is shaping up to be a two-year standoff. Because he's on the last year of his deal, then they would franchise tag him next year. Mike T, I mean, you're a, you're a general manager. What does that do? If, if this is a two-year standoff, if he plays this season without a deal, if he, they franchise him next year, I understand he gets a bunch of money. What does it do? It's destabilizing because it's hard to build your team when you have a massive question mark. Are you franchising him? Is it the exclusive tag? Would somebody give multiple first-round picks? Do we draft somebody? Do we need a veteran to pair with the draft choice? It's hard to put a team around uncertainty, and we saw that with Kirk Cousins for a number of years in Washington. So if I'm the Ravens, I lock Lamar in a room this weekend, I throw out the high, I throw out the low, and I come up with something that we can both live with because without a greenie, this will be the first question that John Harbaugh and Lamar Jackson are asked all season long. Any updates, and it becomes draining, it becomes a distraction, and the task at hand should be like, hey, the off season's over. Let's go win a championship. So Diana told us yesterday that the expectation is that with or without an extension that he is going to play the season. Very quickly, Dominique, and I, whenever we talk about Lamar Jackson, I think back to this picture that we had. I think we have it here uh, of you taking your son to a game and your son is wearing a Lamar Jackson jersey. And so, I mean, there's yeah. a human element to all of this, right? That's a video that, that Dominique took, uh, and that's his son there wearing, you know, a Lamar shirt. Uh, Chiefs game. And, and, so there's a human being, right, we're talking yeah. about, who is, is sitting there with the ability to sign a contract that is going to change, you know, the next seven generations uh, for his family. And, and he might be about to go out there and play without it and, and put himself right. in harm's way, which is what football players do. If he were to call you up and say, hey, should I play this season without this deal? What would you tell him? I'd say absolutely, because I think he is – Outstanding, And I, I understand that he could expose himself to some injury. But again, like we talked about in the first segment, this is a risky game, and that's part of it. You know what I think actually happens? Worst case scenario is that he um, has a mediocre season. Are the Ravens going to then move on? No. He's going to play in the fifth year. He's going to get franchised and continue to get paid. Best case scenario is the price just keeps going up because he plays like the Lamar Jackson that we saw last year prior to injury, like the Lamar Jackson that we saw the year prior to that, frankly, like the only Lamar Jackson we really know as a centerpiece of this offense that is dominant. So I suspect that there's nothing but good things will happen if Lamar goes out there and plays the way that we know he's capable of. All right, starting after week one, I certainly hope that he does. Week one, they play the Jets. Uh, I, I have mixed feelings. All right, hold the football for a minute because we had a Woj bomb yesterday. Daniel said the third-year quarterback was, quote, the resounding highest point winner. That feels significant when you consider the totality of the conversation around Tua during this offseason. Jeremy, what are we hearing? Well, the Dolphins are going to air it out. They are not afraid to let Tua throw the deep ball. The previous Miami regime had some concerns about his limitations throwing the ball. The Dolphins with Mike McDaniel do not care. They believe Tyreek Hill and Tua have a major connection. You saw it in the preseason. You saw it in training camp practices. So he doesn't have a Josh Allen, Justin Herbert type arm, but they feel like he is adequate throwing from all levels of the field. How about it, Mike T? You're down there. You make your home down there in South Florida. What are you hearing from inside about Tua? Yeah, similar to Jeremy, can he get the ball downfield consistently? He was 23rd in the league last year in yards per attempt. And with Jalen Waddell, in addition to Tyreek Hill, they certainly have given him the weapons. This is a consequential year for him. And downfield accuracy will determine his fate in terms of, is he a frontline star in the NFL or not? Look, he's got an Olympic track team playing wide receivers for him, right? You just mentioned it, Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell. There isn't a faster pair of receivers in the NFL. Dominique, how about it? I mean, you, you played corner all these years. We know the Dolphins have two first-round picks going the next year. They lost one of them in, in that, uh, you know, taken away from them. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a consequential year for Tua. What do you expect? Yeah, I have high expectations for Tua, particularly in this offense with a revamped offensive line. And we don't appreciate how important it is that they have a great defense. They've had a great defense for the last several years, and I think that matters a lot. It takes the pressure off of the offense. You don't have to outscore your opponent who are putting up big numbers. As long as you have a defense that can get you the ball back and get some stops, I think it all is coming together quite well, given the offensive structure of Mike McDaniel, that Tua should come out and have a big season with these outstanding weapons and an improved uh, front five. 
So, Mike T., I just want to nail you down on this. You have said many times here you believe Mac Jones is the second best quarterback in that division. By the end of this season, will we still say that or will Tua displace him? No, I still like Mac Jones. I think he's just more consistent uh, inside the pocket. Again, Tua has the opportunity, but if I had to rank him and project him, I still like Mac Jones despite the great weapons the Dolphins got Tua and the question marks that the Patriots have. I just think overall, from a skill set standpoint, Mac Jones is the more consistent player. That's something else. I tell you what, if you look at the names on the backs of the jerseys and everything else, what Tua has to work with, it is set up right now for him. Uh, we'll see what he's able to do down there. In the meantime, we have sneaky, enormous news from college football heading into the first full weekend of games. And I'm going to let Heather talk us through this. Today at 2 o'clock, Presidents and chancellors are meeting to discuss the future expansion of the college football playoff. For all of you who have been all over me in the mentions constantly, Greeny, they need to expand the playoff. Greeny, they may be doing this, and the, the groundwork for it might be getting set today. Heather, take us through what the fans need to know. Well, at the end of the day, Greeny, this could be, could be a historic decision that changes college football's postseason as soon as 2024. But sources indicate that not even people in the room know which way this is going to play out this afternoon. There are several possibilities that have been mentioned. One is that they agree on a 12-team format that begins in the 2026 season. Remember, this contract goes through 20. 2025. If it happens before 2026, these 11 presidents and chancellors must be unanimous in agreement on the format. And so if it's not unanimous, they could change it easy, more easily, I should say, for 2026. And then there's a sense that maybe they can work backwards and say, can we do this for 2025 or 2024? So there are several options that are on the table. They may not even vote. The question is, can they agree on the format? And if so, when? And I just want to underline the most important word you used in all of that was 12. Is that what we are hearing that the conversation will be about a tw Remember, there's four teams in this thing now. About a 12-team playoff? Sources have indicated that that is still the most popular option, but people have told me on the record that 16 should be considered. American Athletic Conference Commissioner Mike Oresco told me this week he thinks that that should at least be on the table, 16. But there are challenges with that, including, and most obviously, the calendar. How do you play that? Too many games. Do you have to eliminate a conference championship game in order to squeeze those games in? I guarantee you. SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey is not getting rid of his championship game. Well, I mean, just let the record show that 14 teams make the playoffs in the NFL. They could be talking about 16 teams in college football. That will require a lot of conversation. Heather, we'll see you Monday as you will be here after what is going to be an enormous first full weekend in college football. But back to the NFL, we'll go next. Russell.